Hello, I'm Liz Lumley of Finextra, and today I'm speaking to Richard Brown of IBM, and we're going to be talking a bit about cryptocurrencies, where the uh, the most famous, or some might say infamous of all, is Bitcoin. So, um, you know, really, sort of talking about alternative currencies or non-sovereign currencies, I mean, what role do you see uh, these types of currencies having in, 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 in global money in the future? So, so my view is quite clear. I believe cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin is the first example, I believe they're going to change the world, but probably not in the way we expect. So I think as we look, look ahead to the next year, the next two years, I think we'll probably see some, some modest adoption of Bitcoin as the first example um, in major markets for some niche um, areas where it's difficult for merchants to get onto card schemes, for example, um, in emerging economies. We may even see quite widespread adoption of Bitcoin on a country by country basis if it begins to take off and, and blossom. And I think it's already pretty obvious that cryptocurrencies, again, Bitcoin in particular, have a really quite powerful role to play in the near term in, in international remittances. Um, I think they solve a real problem that other approaches don't. But I don't think any of that's particularly surprising. There are, there are predictions or um, examples of, of near futures you can make simply by looking at how these currencies work and looking at what some of the startups and what some of the um, providers in this space are already doing. Where I think the debate hasn't got to yet and where I think people haven't really thought this through is, is what happens then? What happens if we imagine that, let's say, Bitcoin has been rolled out even to a small extent in a few countries. So there's an infrastructure laid down, some of the core technology has been, has been invented and it's been implemented. What does that then enable? What could be done after that? If we perhaps look at the, the parallel, if we, at least if we try to draw parallels with what happened in the web and we compare say 94 with 96, not much had changed. If you look at the Yahoo website in 96 and compare it to how it looked in 94, it was still quite primitive. Look at Yahoo now, the world is different, but it took longer to get there than perhaps people imagined. And if you try and draw a similar parallel with cryptocurrencies, I think there are some features, some core, core elements of the technology of these cryptocurrencies that are going to have a really important effect and people haven't thought that through. So if we take just two examples maybe to kick it off, um, something that I think people have missed with, um, with, with Bitcoin in particular is although people think of it as a digital cash or as, um, as money, um, the secret is Bitcoin is not perfectly fungible. You can tell every single piece of currency in the Bitcoin system from any other. Mm -hmm. If I pay you money with cash, it's very hard for me to trace that. If I pay you with a Bitcoin, I can see exactly what you do with that. I can see who you send it to and I can see what happens to that coin for the rest of all time. So if I've now got a system... That's that not I, what's supposed to happen, though, is it? Well, no. <laughs> and, um, so people think this is a perfectly mm. anonymous system. And, um, and I guess there's some, some things we can say on that as well. Mm. But if you think through, the, think through the consequences of that, what that means is Bitcoin today is perhaps best thought of as a currency and payment system. But in reality, it's a very sophisticated, globally distributed asset register. Mm. Um, those things we're moving around that we call Bitcoins are individually identifiable and associated with an owner who's the only person who can then spend them on. So today, they have value. One Bitcoin may be worth $150. But there's no reason why I, as an individual or as a trusted company, can't say, I assert that that Bitcoin is actually 100 shares of Twitter, say. And wherever that gets moved to, whoever owns it on the day the, div on the, day the dividend is paid, um, they receive the dividend rather than somebody else. It's not difficult to see that system being used to build the next generation's central securities depository or custodian mm -hmm. bank. Um, it, that technology is very, very generalized and it's not just a currency and payment system. So there's a whole area of innovation that hasn't even begun yet, building on this idea of a publicly visible, globally distributed asset register that just happens today to be used as a digital currency. Mm -hmm. So you're in like the long term very, very bullish on currencies such as Bitcoin. I am. I think there is so much technical innovation here. The, um, the core technology, had you asked me five years ago, I would have said was impossible. Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies solve this problem of coming to a consensus globally where you don't trust anybody else. Mm -hmm. 
I'm a computer scientist. I thought that was impossible. These guys have proved it can be done. So that has implications both for currencies and payments, for asset registers, but also for how we engineer systems um, for ourselves and for our clients. So regardless of whether this currency takes off or another one does, there's a huge amount of innovation that previously did not exist. So, I mean, we've been seeing recently a lot of investment interest in a lot of Bitcoin entrepreneurs. It seems to be the cool Silicon Valley business now to, to, get, to get involved with. Um, you know, but also recently, you know, one of the biggest criticisms of, of Bitcoin was its role in, supposed alleged role in, in the illegal drug trade. And, um, you know, the FBI and the U.S. have uh, supposedly shut down the Silk Road uh, black market for illegal drugs, which um, supposedly was holding up a lot of the Bitcoin economy. Now that that sort of business has been shut down, will will all of these Bitcoin will, will will this give the Bitcoin entrepreneurs more legitimacy? That that criminal aspect of using Bitcoin now seems to be being destroyed, and people can now go and build their cool Silicon Valley startups and get VC funding. Do you think that's where we're moving towards? Uh, short answer, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's unambiguously a good thing that Silk Road has been taken down. Um, it, as you say, it legitimizes Bitcoin in the eyes of everybody else. It shows that Bitcoin isn't just used for um, illegal activities. And the proof for me there was when the Silk Road takedown was, um, was announced to the world, the Bitcoin price did drop, as one might expect, but it recovered very quickly, which tells me based on that evidence alone, that there is clearly an economy underneath this that is not dependent on that trade. So, so I think it's, it's, it's good because it takes away some of the fear for major organizations and potentially and particularly financial institutions who would not want to be associated with something that otherwise would be associated with, um, with illegal activity. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the law enforcement agencies have taken it down, but more importantly shown that they can take it down shows that Bitcoin can be regulated and it is possible to prosecute crime um, on it. So I think it's an ambiguously a good thing that's been taken down and it does enable opportunities for, for others, for legitimate business people. Mm -hmm. But sort of outside of the criminal, uh, alleged criminal uh, uh, impact uh, activity with Bitcoin, a lot of the mythology around the start of Bitcoin was around this sort of anarcho-libertarian, -liber anonymous, non-sovereign currency. And that, you know, you mentioned that the, the Bitcoins can be tracked because they're, they're on a computer. Mm -hmm. um, but the myth around it is that this is anonymous, you know, which is why maybe it was very popular in illegal uh, industries. But is it, I mean, does the future of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies even depend on anonymity anymore? I mean, is that, it, will that myth of anonymity, uh, will that need to be kept with the, with the Bitcoin economy, or is that going to be sort of pushed aside? So I, th I think you put your finger on it when you said the, the myth of anonymity. Um, the reality is Bitcoin to a first approximation, cryptocurrencies to a first approximation, do, op do offer a degree of anonymity. The, the blockchain, as they call it, the public register of every transaction is visible to anybody in the world who wants to look at it, but none of the transactions are associated with an identity. Um, so to a first approximation, it's anonymous. But the reality is, for somebody motivated to attach a transaction, to link a transaction to an identity, it is not difficult. The blockchain is completely public and every payment can be tracked, as you say. So provided you find the identity of one transaction, you can trace forward or back to any others. It's no surprise to me that the more switched on financial regulators have alighted on that fact and have chosen to address most of their regulatory activity at the exchanges and at the edge points of the network where bitcoins are exchanged for other currencies. Because there you have a legal entity, there you have a corporation, you can serve a subpoena against them, you can get their records, and then you can just follow the blockchain serving subpoenas on each person you find until you get to your target. So sure, it's probably more complicated for law enforcement, but back to the takedown of Silk Road, it shows it can be done. But it does, it does raise a really interesting question. If we separate identity from asset ownership, is this another source of potential innovation? So in today's world, uh, every asset is owned by a legal entity, either a human or a corporation, and there, is, there are anti-money anti laundering laws and you know, your customer laws that, that sit around that. But if you take away that constraint that every asset on the Bitcoin system is owned by an individual, does that enable some things that otherwise wouldn't have been possible? 
So to take perhaps an extreme example, but to take but to force the point, if we look at say the Internet of Things and some of the more um, some of the more um, advanced ideas people have put there about um, um, smart meters everywhere and the Internet fridge, and the, the, my, the my toaster, knowing how much bread I have. Exactly yeah. the Internet <laughs> toaster and these these usual cliches. Um, what those things seem to miss is the um, is is the economic analysis underneath them. So you could imagine a world where actually my fridge has an identity on the blockchain. My fridge is able to look at the energy price perhaps it's able to trade with my washing machine to decide who needs the power most and then to buy the power they need on, on, on the spot market. It's, it's, it's not a big stretch to imagine that if you separate legal identity from, um, from asset ownership on the blockchain, new possibilities around um, autonomous agents and the like become possible. Um, it's almost as if you could almost say, you know, you know, on the blockchain, nobody knows you're a fridge. Uh, <laughs> that's the kind of place you could get to. So we, we've talked a lot about Bitcoin, but I mean, there is, there is sort of a greater question about cryptocurrencies in, in general. I mean, does five, ten years from now, will the question about Bitcoin even matter? Is it is it going to be more about, will we have a, a choice of several different cryptocurrencies to choose from? Where do you see this going? I think, I think we probably will see a choice. I mean, the beauty of this system is that a thousand flowers can bloom. Um, at the moment, we have Bitcoin as the most well-known cryptocurrency, but already there are other systems competing for attention. So there are some such as Litecoin, for example, that are really testing the idea that psychology matters. If we have a larger num nominal number of currency units, does that change people's behavior? Um, and that, that's, I mean, my view is that's really a question of psychology. There's, um, there's another system, Frycoin, which is based on the question of how do you get people to spend? If we think these things are going to accumulate in value, why would you spend them? So they're experimenting with ways to encourage um, they're experimenting with ways to encourage spending. And you could imagine a lot more experiments happening. So I can imagine there will probably be quite a few economics PhDs over the, following, in, over the coming years who've assessed this um, space and realized they can do some natural or real experiments using um, um, spin-offs from, um, from the cryptocurrencies. But then there's also the, the other angle from this, which is I mentioned earlier that the technological cat is, is out of the bag. Um, even if the currencies themselves shut down overnight, the core technology of distributed consensus, um, the core idea that actually the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency model is credit transfer rather than direct debit, there are some key insights or key technologies that can be applied to how we build other systems or how we solve other clients' problems. So, so my view is, um, as well as looking ahead five, ten years and thinking where we need to position ourselves as financial institutions, as engineers and computer scientists, we should also be looking at this to say, does this have, does this have um, implications for how we build systems today? Mm. Well, that's interesting. Okay, well, mm. we'll look forward to the next five, ten years in the currency markets. Thanks, thank, thank you very much.